Hi, I'm Michael. And I'm Ross. We're dementia researchers. And we also love old cars. In this series, we're going to interview some of the brightest minds in the dementia field. And we're obviously going to do that in old cars. Let's go for a ride. Our guest today is Professor Sir John Hardy, a geneticist and molecular biologist at UCL. He proposed the amyloid cascade hypothesis back in the early 90s, which remains the preeminent model for thinking about the cascade of events that goes wrong in Alzheimer's disease. This was in part based on his work discovering rare genes that cause the familial version of Alzheimer's disease. And he told us about his favorite childhood car, and of course, we had to get it for him. Hello. Hi. <laughs> oh, hello, John. Shall good I jump in? Good to see you. This is your ride. It's lovely. I love the color. It's smaller than I remember it, but... <laughs> you good? So what do you drive at the moment, John? I'm afraid I drive a Honda Jazz at the moment. Seven years old. You're afraid? <laughs> well, you know, it's a... Uh, I mean, it's a great little car, but it's entirely practical. You see what I mean? There's nothing, you know, romantic about it. It's grey to like about, um, you know, about 30% of the cars on the road look like Honda Jazzes or, you know, a car that's so similar you have to look at the the, um, the plate to know it's not a Honda. <laughs> but you are a bit of a petrol head. I sense you would buy a classic car. Uh, you know, I know that I'm not practical enough to, to run a classic car. So I wouldn't, but I would, yeah. I mean, I've looked at, uh, well, my brother, for example, is a Citroen 2CV fanatic. And I've looked at the prices of cars like this, the Morris Minor, you know, and, and dreamed of, of, of them, but I would never own one because I know that within a few weeks, it would be, you know, needing a lot of attention. I'm just not good enough at uh, practical things own something that needs maintenance. But you've worked in a lot of different countries. Did you have different cars when you were in the US, in Sweden, UK? Yeah, in the US nothing interesting. Oh. But in Sweden, it's before I went to Sweden, I went there with my family to Umeå. And, um, you know, I had at the time, well I had one young kid, my daughter, and my son, elder son was born in Umeå. And um, so we knew we were going to be moving all of our stuff from Newcastle, where I worked, to the north of Sweden. So I bought a, um, a, a, a VW Microbus. Oh, really? We all our stuff in a VW Microbus to Umeå. And I bought a VW Microbus because it was air-cooled, and I was really worried that when I got to the north of Sweden, it would... Um, all freeze up and cause horrible damage. It's a very legitimate concern. Oh, this is where James Parkinson lives. That was James Parkinson's um, blue plaque. Is that right? Really? Yeah. We've just passed Hoxton. This is Hoxton this Square. Is Hoxton Square. Yeah, 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 that's where. Yeah. That's where James Parkinson um, had his practice. Wow, amazing. Thank you. So, um, so what is the overlap then between Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, since we're on the subject? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think there's... Well, I think the commonality is that uh, there are diseases where proteins build up, and in part, in my view, they build up because the degradation method mechanisms fail. But in the two diseases, the predominant protein degradation mechanisms are different. And I mean, this is 
if you like, my idea rather than a fact. But in, in Alzheimer's disease, the major failure is uh, microglia. Do you want to just have a quick look? There's, yeah. there, there is a... There is, there is, but it's called Havana now. I, I wonder what that was. It looks like a cocktail. No, bar. it's a cocktail bar now, though it looks like it's uh, closed. Uh, I didn't know he was a geologist as well. Yeah, he's he's quite a remarkable character, actually. He was also a social reformer, and you know, so on and so forth. So, yeah, yeah. So. So there are obvious differences genetically, but are there commonalities, yeah, are there common so traits genetically between the dementia so disorders? The same genes, they're not, the same genes do not show up. So there's very little overlap in the genes which are involved. But, you know, one is microglial degradation of proteins, that's Alzheimer's disease, and one is largely lysosomal degradation of proteins, and that's Parkinson's disease. So, you know, com you know, the themes are the same, but they're, they're pretty, pretty well distinct. And so when you started in, in, in genetics and dementia, what did the field look like back then? I mean, it, it must have been very new. <laughs> <laughs> very well, scarce. It's a very polite way of saying, You've been doing this for a hell of a long time. <laughs> and, um, well, what, what I'll say is that um, in um, certainly, when, so the first Alzheimer conference I went to was probably in 1976, something like that. Where was it? Um, where was it? In London, I think. Uh, the, no, no, perhaps 1978. So the... Um, Firstly, what had been discovered then was the um, cholinergic deficit, and that had been discovered by uh, David Bowen, who was, at, who was at Queen Square, and uh, Elaine Perry in Newcastle, Elaine and Bob Perry in Newcastle, and Peter Davies in Edinburgh. And so people were excited about that because, and obviously they were right to be excited because you know, that eventually led to the therapies we use today, which is cholinergic therapy. But in terms of causes of the disease, it was chaos. Anybody could say anything. There was no overwrite, no, if you like, no single idea around which people focused their efforts. And so some people said it's slow viruses. Some people said it was metal deficiency. Some people said it was a vascular problem. Some people said it was aluminium overdosing. Some people say all of these things still. Yeah. What do you have to say about that? Those, with respect to those people, I think they're a fringe. They're a fringe group now. I think that uh, you know that, that. So, you know, I think. Yeah, I think that things are more unified now. And that's. I think largely good because it means that people have generally the same idea and so people are working within the same framework. You know, it also leads to uh, a problem in a sense if that idea is wrong, a very high proportion of effort is going to just one, just one track, if you like. Right. So you were probably, I mean, I'm saying this again, not to say you're old at all, but you were one of the pioneers working on population-based genetics and dementia. What, what did that entail back then? What was the approach? Well, I should say firstly, the, the thing that I was a pharmacologist by training, not a geneticist. The thing that really uh, influenced me was Gusella's paper in 1983 showing that Huntingdon's the Huntingdon's gene was on chromosome 4. And, uh, you know, I suddenly realized, real, reading that paper, that you could find out how a neurological disease started by studying the genetics. So that, that really caused me to change my research focus. And I was fortunate being in a department which was very strong from a genetics perspective to be able to, to do that with support from the department. I mean, I should say that my head of department there, Bob Williamson, supported me entirely.
entirely from his own funds for the first five years because I didn't get any research grants. You know, I couldn't get research grants for the first five years. So, you know, it was I was very lucky in that respect. But it's very difficult to find, you know, heads of departments who were wealthy enough and as well as foresighted enough. To yeah. support someone for so long. How did you keep mot motivation and your curiosity? I Maintain did. not getting grants for five years. I have to say, that is a long stretch and it's, it's, it's beautiful you're sharing this because... Well, motivation, yeah. I mean, I don't think I had a choice. I had, to, <laughs> I, had to, I had to keep supporting my family. So, you know, yeah, I just kept, yeah, but I just kept going. You I could have just, you know, gone into a more mainstream area and tried to I get a grant or something. Right. I guess that's right. But, you know, I was really convinced by the, by just the, the, the power of molecular genetics, really, to find out how diseases start. And um, so that's, 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 that was what I did. So you, so you had this hunch, you, you had the hunch that there was a gene. Tell us how you found the first gene uh, in Alzheimer's disease. So, um, well, I worked with Martin Rosset. Martin and I wrote a letter to the Alzheimer's Society, which they published in, um, in their monthly newsletter, advertising for families to come to, to us and to write. We had a, a research nurse called Penelope Rokes, and we collected the letters all came in and then uh, and Penelope would go round, she loved her job, she would go around the country, as she described it, gossiping to her families to find out the family trees, get the family trees and collect blood samples for us to do genetic analysis. Uh, that's how it worked. But the very first letter we got, the very first letter we got was from uh, the, the Bexon family in, uh, in Nottingham at that time, and this is all public so their names are well known, the, uh, and uh, saying, showing their family tree. And they had, she had uh, five uncles and aunts, all of, including, well, her father and four uncles and aunts, all of whom had Alzheimer's disease at the age of about 50, 55. So we collected, that was one of the first families we collected, and that's how we started. And that family very clearly showed, that we had a couple of false starts, that family very clearly showed that, um, that all of the family members who had the disease shared a small area on chromosome 21. And that area contained the amyloid gene, and sure enough when we sequenced the amyloid gene, we found mutations. So it sounds simple now. We made a couple of, uh, we made, I said it's a mistake. We, there was one thing we didn't know at the time, and that is that there were m many different causes of disease. And we'd assumed that all of the families would have mutations in the same gene. And that misled our analysis for a period of about, um, I would say two or three years. So it took us a little longer, well, I mean, it took us longer than it would do uh, if we'd had that knowledge beforehand. That's all very well, John, but do you know how to put a Morris Minor in reverse? <laughs> <laughs> You're on your own there, son. <laughs> oh, yeah, you've got it now. They are lovely cars, though, aren't they? Just There's lovely. got so much character. So obviously, talking about amyl. Actually, no. I I do want to know how was how was the reception when you tried to publish this. Was oh. it easy? Oh well. Kai told us uh, earlier, you know, when he when he tried to get the first CSF, I think Tau papers in and Annals Neurology, it was editorially rejected. And they said, the first reviewer said, oh, the editor said, it would never end up in clinic. Oh, is that right? I mean, well, 
I actually, well, there was two stages to it, in a sense, because with uh, Christine Van Bruckhoven, a year earlier, we'd shown that congophilic, I, I, I say we had shown, in fact, she led this study, but she had shown that, that um, congophilic angiopathy, which involves amyloid deposition only in blood vessels, was caused by mutations in the amyloid gene. So that work had been done before, and so that work was, if you like, the had prepared the prepared the, the the way for this as a finding. But did we? Was it difficult to publish? No, it wasn't difficult to publish. The review. I mean, I think that the, the you know the data was really pretty convincing. We had the family we'd identified, and then we found a second family which Alan Roses had collected, which had the same um, mutations. Oh, There's look at this. We've got a friend. That's this is a great street. Look at this. this, this is wow. Yeah. There's, there's, minor and this. There's, another, there's another countryman. Yeah, I don't know. That looks like a few 500s under there. There's a, there's oh, yeah. a fanatic on this street. Yeah, it's inside my street. There we go. I guess it's, it's difficult to argue with three or four generations of yeah, autism exactly. dominant family history and a gene though, isn't it? But, but this is what I would say is that um, after we published it, I got absolute, it was like the field went into shock and I got no, I didn't get any response from any, for example, US groups at all, got absolutely no no response and the sense I had afterwards uh, at the time I just thought it was surprising that no one had phoned me up or you know asked for information just nothing but afterwards I think I felt that they were in shock <laughs> you think they grasp how big is this how, how big this would grow or did they uh, yeah I think so I think that they were in shock I think they were in shock yeah that's what I actually so you're going to get American in UK groups working in the same fight things, but you, you don't think they had families of their own that's completely novel to them? Uh, well, no, they did have families. Well, we found, we found, uh, as I said, one of Alan Rose's families had, had the same mutation. And um, then about six months or nine months later, a family with Indiana, in, from Indiana showed, showed up with a similar, not the same, mutation and the Peter Hislop in Toronto again about six to nine months later had a family with the same mutation so you know they did they did start to find the mutations but it was just the silence that surprised, that surprised me and when was that broken uh, maybe well actually in a sense it was broken I started to get job offers to go to the States. <laughs> so that was one way that it was broken, you know. You know so which you took eventually. Which I took eventually, yeah. And so, was that, a, was that a career highlight for you? or What, finding amyloid mutations? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean... But you have had others, I mean... Yeah, 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 no, no, that's very nice of you. And I have to say, I don't want to sound too kind of crazy, but you know the um, you know in the in the pop world, one of the fears that pop stars have if they have a number one record is that they're going to be a one-hit wonder, and uh, you know that was definitely something that uh, that occurred to me too. You know this was going to be it, and um, you know so so uh, and in fact when we went to the states. And I was in the States by late 1992. I wrote a grant to the NIH, and uh, one of the reviewer comments came back, and this was probably in January 1993, saying this group hasn't done anything since they found amyloid mutations, which was you know only you know a year earlier. And I thought. Considering we've moved labs and continents, I thought that was a pretty hard... That's, that, that's fairly harsh. That's a harsh review. So, following this discovery of the genes, the amyloid genes, you created uh, an hypothesis. 
can you tell us a little bit about what this hypothesis entailed and how this how this hypothesis came about? Because this hypothesis has been so influential in the field of Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, I feel. I mean, so well, two things. Firstly, I didn't. I never regarded it as my hypothesis. What I thought was, you know, the nice thing about genetics, and I, I said before there were all these theories about the disease. I thought the genetics is an independent way of saying which of these theories is right. And George Glenner and to some extent Colin Masters and Conrad Bayreuther had all been saying amyloid was important. And I felt that really genetics was the referee. And the genetics should referee which of these hypotheses is the right hypothesis. And so that's what I considered my, um, that's what I considered yeah, you're going to fail your test. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing very well, am I? <laughs> it's all on camera. You, the, uh, yeah. the, uh, you know, I thought felt that, that really the genetics was the referee between these hypotheses, and we should just declare which hypothesis was right. So that's why I wrote it. Now, the amyloid cascade hypothesis, as written in, in science, which you're right has been influential, was what what happened was that uh, Jerry Higgins had made mice which he claimed had amyloid pathology. In fact, it later turned out that that was fraudulent. So, bizarrely, that, that paper was fraudulent. And he had contacted the editor of Science and said, would you like a, a hypothesis article? And uh, so, and the editor of Science had said yes. And so, I wrote the, the article, um, um, I wrote 90% of the article, and I wrote it literally over one weekend, without thought, you know, really without thought, and it was written in, in, in virtually one go, and then I sent it to Jerry, Jerry put in a diagram and changed a few words. And then it went in, and to my amazement, it was accepted. I thought, wow, it's easy to get a paper in science. <laughs> but that's what, what happened. And if you'd said to me, um, you know, that this paper was going to be influential for over 30 years, well, firstly, I'd have spent more time <laughs> <laughs> writing it and thinking about it. Uh, but, you know, I would have been amazed because it was really written over a weekend without, without thought or consideration. This is, I'm just declaring which of the uh, ideas we have had about disease is right. And so that's, now, I still think, I mean, I, I, I still think it's got an, a lot of truth to it. But, you know, to say it's simplistic is... To say it's simplistic is a, a, an understatement for sure and um, you know I also think in a sense it's so simplistic that to, to some extent it's been misleading so you know I it's very very you know I'm pleased I'm very proud of the work we did and uh, that uh, was done I should say and that it was done with Alison Goat as an equal partner. I'm very proud of all of that work, but it's, you know, I'm also surprised at um, how long it's lasted and also a bit embarrassed when people say, you know, come out and defend the amyloid hypothesis because, later. yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, to come back to the stupid analogy about pop stars, you know, I don't want to be like a pro Harum going out doing white a shade of pale every weekend you know that's you know I feel I've got some new singles I want people to <laughs> to buy is, is that like the trim two singles? yeah exactly <laughs> the tau and the cyanuclein and trim two yeah exactly so this hypothesis has been influential and, co and controversial probably mostly because it has led to the dominating development when it comes to allegedly disease modifying treatments that are trying to remove amyloid and then when you say genetics is the referee, 
I find that interesting because really the, the, the pure genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease are extremely rare. They're less than 1% of all cases, right? Then amyloid is important also in sporadic Alzheimer's disease, obviously, but there the connection is so much harder to make. Yes, I agree. Still. So that's why I guess a lot of people found it controversial throughout this time. There's no doubt amyloid is playing an important role. But really, 99% of all Alzheimer's cases do not have a genetic, a clear genetic cause and link to that. So that's probably still a, a challenge to explain when people ask you about that. Or what would you tell them now? No, well, firstly, I agree with that. And, uh, you know, I absolutely agree with that. I think we've resolved that now, finally, because what we're finding is the risk genes for Alzheimer's disease, APOE, and all of the microglial genes, what we're finding is they are all involved in amyloid clearance. So in the early, uh, to, to oversimplify, early onset disease is basically producing too much amyloid or, um, or, or, or producing a less soluble form of amyloid and late onset disease is predisposed to by, by failing to clear it basically that's 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 the if you like the yin and the yang so i think we understand we understand that now but you're right that for many many years and to a small extent i think still that was not clear and i have to say too that when we were looking for risk genes for alzheimer's disease we thought we were going to be finding amyloid app processing genes and Although we found a couple of those, we largely did not, we largely found microglial genes, which was, a, well, it was a surprise to me, a, I think a surprise to the field. So if, if in clinical practice, if this does turn out to be, to start off as a clearance, an amyloid clearance problem, how are we going to pick that up? Because that's presumably going to happen subtly over decades before symptom onset. So what, how, how are we going to do that? When you say pick it up, what, what well, this is what... This, this equilibrium of amyloid clearance. So, well, this is what, uh, currently, this is what I would do. I would look at genetic risk, which we can now do using polygenic risk score analysis, looking at all the genes, and look for people who are at high risk of disease. And then in those who were high risk, like uh, in those individuals, look at um, uh, their blood biomarkers for a beta and for the tau markers of, um, of plaque formation. So that's what I would do. I would do wholesale genetic screening, which is happening to a large extent in the UK now or beginning to happen. And then with those at high risk, I would do d more detailed biomarker and perhaps eventually even PET PET amyloid scan analysis. That's how I would do it. Yeah, and you think we'll get some kind of clearance signature from the genetics? Yes, I think I think that that that's yeah, that's definitely how I would design it. But you know, as we know, you know the the biomarker field has developed so much over the last five years, five years, that maybe there'll be other. The, but there'll be other breakthroughs which would slightly alter that uh, that strategy. But it's it's you know that's I, I actually think that the biomarker area over the last five to ten years has both been the most exciting part of Alzheimer research. Well, it's definitely outpaced the treatment part. But, but uh, yes. now, what's your take on on the coming trials? There are a couple of phase three uh, anti-amyloid trials. Let's pass this guy. Well, firstly, Ajun Karaban. Yeah. I um, I uh, think, I kind of, I, well, I believe, if you like, I, I don't want to use the word believe because it sounds a bit religious, but I believe the Biogen's interpretation of their data, which is that in a few very mildly affected individual, there was a mild, uh, uh, you know, a mildly beneficial effect. 
but even though that was a post-hoc analysis, on cognition. On, on, I think there was, I, 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 I agree with them. However, I think that that, that that increase was firstly too mild to be clinically useful and secondly it was too difficult it's too difficult to root to identify the patients who might benefit routinely and so I, I did think it was a mistake to uh, uh, you know uh, approve it by the FDA I did, I, if I'd have been on that board I think I would have voted against approval so you know i think but i think they're right on the science on the if you like on the science so what would you have told them go, go back and do what exactly another trial and design it how oh, well I, that, that I'm, that's outside my real area of expertise um, but what i will say is i've been very impressed by the way that lily have designed and carried out their donanumab trial and I think that, that the data I've seen which is only public data is consistent with that being if you like a similar but stronger drug and I'm hopeful that that will get approval I'm really hopeful it does I mean so you do believe we are closer to a not a if not a cure than a treatment yeah I think we are closer yeah I do I do think so you know but I've been but I will also say I've been wrong before you know so um, so if that as you said the, the biomarker field has developed incredibly in the past uh, years and, and if now the treatment field is actually getting there what should governments you know decision makers funders foundations what should they do to prepare for this now what do we That's need a very good question that's a very good question and one of the, if you like, the benefits of the aducanumab approval is it's punctured the uh, kind of complacency about what health services need to do to um, prepare for this sort of outcome because, you know, health services need to be prepared to, to be able to identify people very early in the disease process. And for, for example, in the UK system, that's very, very difficult. So, you know, if you like, a, 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 a beneficial outcome of, of anu, aducanumab's, I mean, obviously it wasn't approved in the UK, but a beneficial effect of aducanumab's approval is it should be alerting the health systems they need to get ready for when the, the um, for when judgment day comes we might be thinking about building more pet centers here in the uk although i'm a, i'm a fan of the um, i'm a i'm a fan of the blood biomarkers personally yeah. so if i guess if a healthcare system was to implement anything on a scalable level I, as a as a pet guy, will say it's not going to be pet, <laughs> so that will likely be blood. I think pet will always have a place uh, for the really difficult places, and I think the traces are good in Alzheimer's disease to to you know create some clarity there. But for for a, an early screening, Akai was a little reluctant to to say it would be a diagnostic marker, but he definitely would use it as a screening marker. I mean, I think. You know, the Donanumab, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, trial, where they were very careful. Firstly, you had to be amyloid positive, And secondly, uh, I hope I'm quoting this accurately. Secondly, you had to have either no tau pathology or only a little bit. Well, you had to have an intermediate level of yeah. tau on tau pet. Yeah. Not too little, not too much. Exactly. Now, that's a lot of work. That is a lot of work for each patient. So, um, but you know, maybe that's paying paying off. I've, I've only seen the public data, but maybe that's paying off. I really hope so. But the other thing I'll say is that, um, you know, the Wright brothers flew on that Carolina beach. And uh, who would have thought, seeing the Wright brothers flying on that Carolina beach, a one mile flight, 
um, on in a basically converted bicycle that you would have international flights within a couple of decades in other words when you've got a treatment when you have a treatment just like when you have flight it's easier to get better flight when you've got a treatment I think it'll be easier to get better treatments you know you know what you need to do yeah. and you so uh, you know I think that we shouldn't yeah I think that it, it will be easier down the line to get to improve on that just as it was easier to get better aeroplanes and so John why the modest minor so yeah so my dad was um, an insurance man and in, he worked for the Royal Liverpool London and Glow in, um, it, well it, at this time in Warrington in, uh, well actually Warrington was in Lancashire when I was born, it's, it's scandalously that now moved into Cheshire, oh so which I think is really disreputable. Anyway, he was, uh, he was in, uh, in Warrington and we didn't have a car and uh, one day my dad came home and he'd been given a company car it was it was oh, it was probably early 1959 i was yeah 4 years old and i was so excited so excited that we were going to join the car owning classes and uh, because most people actually in Lancashire in Warrington anyway did not have cars I mean that was so we now had a car and I ran outside and it was a grey Morris Minor and I was so excited. Is it true that this is the first time you're sitting in the front seat? Yeah I don't think my mum always sat in the front seat and um, in fact in those days just by the way if my dad was using the car at the weekend for a family trip he had to tell his office that the that, that, that we were going to drive to Blackpool that weekend on a family trip he would always be allowed to drive to Blackpool but that would mean that my mum was always in the front seat and uh, I would always be in the back seat so 1959 so that was an early one this is this was uh, right at the end of production, I think this is 1970. And this, of course, is the Woody, the Woody wagon. Yeah, yeah, well, ours was the, was the uh, plain, the plain one. That's exactly right. So, John, what do you do when you're not doing research? We, we go to France very frequently. That's what, that's what we do. Yeah, I would say that's the thing we do the most of. We go to France and uh, beautiful. work in the weekends, on the weekends there. And I have, a, I have a last question. You've been knighted recently, and <laughs> congratulations on that, yes. obviously. So how was that? How, what is that like? And who did it? Oh, I haven't actually had the sword waved over my head yet. That'll happen later in the year, I think. I got a letter in early December and uh, asking if I would turn it down. And I'm actually against knighthoods, but also I thought, you know, I'm not famous enough that people aren't going to be impressed that I turned down the knighthood. <laughs> They're going to think, who is this guy I've never heard of? You know, so I didn't turn it down. And anyway, of course I'm pleased. And of course my mother is really made up. She's pleased as and well. And will the Queen be swinging the sword? I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hoping not. I'm not so sure I would trust her with a heavy metal sword over my head. I, I've watched a couple of these things online. And it seems to be usually Princess Anne who does the business. Okay, so do, do keep us updated. Yeah, I know. I'll send you pictures. Tell us what happened at the airport, John. Well, what happened is that uh, it was at the hotel. I turned up at a hotel and um, my then wife had packed my suitcase and I was checking in when Jerry Schellenberg, who's one of my, uh, well, I think the word is frenemies. He heads another uh, Alzheimer genetics lab and um, he turned up at the same time. And we were both checking in at the same time. I went up to my room and I took what I thought, obviously, was my bag. And when I got up to my room, you know, when I pack, I never fold my clothes. Let me just say, I just, you might not be, you might be surprised, 
that I don't have creased and iron shirts and so on, but uh, I never. And when I got to my room, all the shirts had been ironed and creased and the trousers were pressed. So I thought, wow, that was nice of my wife to do that. So anyway, I didn't think much of it. Next morning, I put these clothes on and went downstairs. And of course, they were Jerry Schellenberg's clothes. <laughs> And, you know, perhaps worse than that is Jerry refused to have those clothes back afterwards. So I got to keep his uh, nicely pressed shirt and trousers. And was he sporting yours? No, 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 no. He realised immediately that, that my scruffy clothes thrown in the bag were, were nothing to do with him. So, so he did end up with your bag? He d oh, yeah, he had my bag. He had my bag and my clothes but he had the good sense not to wear them. <laughs>